And when you have finished Udolfo, we will read the Italian together. And I have made out a list of ten or twelve more of the same kind for you. I will read you their names directly. Here they are in my pocket book. Castle of Wolfenbach, Claremont, Mysterious Warnings, Necromancer of the Black Forest, Midnight Bell, Orphan of the Rhine, and Horrid Mysteries. Those will last us some time. Yes, pretty well. But are they all horrid? Are you sure they are all horrid? Yes, quite sure. Let's read some horrid novels. Hello, Sugar Plum. Uh, I was so excited about this idea that I decided I would just start right now, immediately, and I wasn't going to care about washing my hair or, like, wearing anything nice. It's just going to be who I actually am. So, uh, but unfortunately, I looked at our first book, Castle Wolfenbach, uh, and it doesn't, it doesn't have chapters, it's just two volumes, and the volumes are kind of long. So to get around that, I decided that what we would do is we would set a timer for 10 minutes, and uh, I'll read for 10 minutes, and then like my timer will go off and I'll stop mid-sentence, and I will read to you the words to use, like control F to find where to start reading for the next one. Uh, and we'll just do 10 minute chunks back and forth, however much of the story that happens to be in 10 minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and get started uh, with, with the timer. Right. 10 minutes. The Castle of Wolfenbach, in two volumes, by Eliza Parsons, 1793. The clock from the old castle had just gone eight, when the peaceful inhabitants of a neighboring cottage on the skirts of the wood were about to seek that repose which labor had been <laughs> already I've lost it that repose which labor had rendered necessary and minds blessed with innocence and tranquility assured them the enjoyment of the evening was cold and tempestuous the rain poured in torrents and the distant thunders rolled with tremendous noise round the adjacent mountains whilst the pale lightning added horrors to the scene it actually said whilst this is incredible pierre was already in bed and jacqueline Jacqu jacqueline and jacqueline to follow when the trampling of horses was heard and immediately a loud knocking at the door they were both alarmed. Pierre listened. Jacqueline trembled. The knocking was repeated with more violence. The peasant threw on his humble garment and, advancing to the door, demanded who was there. Two travelers, answered a gentle voice, overtaken by the storm. Pray, friend, afford us shelter. Oh, cried Jacqueline, perhaps they may be robbers and we shall be murdered. Foe, simpleton, said Pierre. What can they expect to rob us of? He opened the door and discovered a man supporting a lady who appeared almost fainting. Pray, friend, said the man, permit this lady to enter your cottage. I fear she has suffered much from the storm. Poor soul, I am sorry for her. Enter and welcome, cried Pierre. Jacqueline placed her wooden armchair by the chimney, ran for some wood, and kindled a blaze in a moment, whilst Pierre put the horse into a little outhouse which held their firing and his working implements, and returned, returned with a port mantua to the lady. They had only some bread and milk to her, but they made it warm and prevailed on their guest to take some. The man, who appeared an attendant, did the same. The lady soon got her clothes dry, but she wanted rest, and they had no bed to offer. One single room answered all their purposes of life. Their humble bed was on the floor in the corner of it, but though mean, it was whole and clean. Jacqueline entreated the lady to lie down. She refused for some time, but growing faint from exhausted spirits and fatigue, she was compelled to accept the offer. The others sat silently round the fire, but alas, horror and affliction precluded sleep, and the fair traveller, after laying about two hours, returned again to the fireside, weary and unrefreshed. "'Is there any house near this?' demanded she. "'No, madam,' replied Jacqueline. "'There is no house. "'But there is a fine old castle just by. "'Of course there is. "'Where there is room enough, "'for only one old man and his wife live in it, "'and, Lord help us, I would not be in their place "'for all the fine things there.' "'Why so?' said the lady. "'Oh, dear madam, why, it is haunted.' <sighs> 
There are bloody floors, prison rooms, and scriptions, they say, on the windows to make a body's hair stand on end. And how far from your cottage is this castle? A little step, madam, farther up the wood. And do you think we could obtain entrance there? Oh, Lord, yes, madam, and thank you, too. Why, the poor old souls rejoice, bleh, rejoice to see a body call there now and then. I go sometimes in the middle of the day, but I take good care to keep from the fine rooms and never to be out after dark. I wish, said the lady, it was possible to get there. Pierre instantly offered his service to conduct her as soon as it was light, and notwithstanding some very horrible stories recounted by Jacqueline, she determined to visit this proscribed place. When the morning came, the inhabitants of the cottage set out for the castle. The lady was so much enfeebled from fatigue and want of rest that she was obliged to be placed on the horse, and they found it very difficult to lead him through the thickets. They at length espied a fine old building with two wings and a turret on the top, where a large clock stood. A high wall surrounded the house. A pair of great gates gave entrance into a spacious court surrounded with flowering shrubs, which lay broken and neglected on the ground, intermixed with the weeds, which were above a foot high in every part. Whilst the... Every time, that's going to make me laugh. Whilst the lady's attendant lifted her from the horse, Pierre repaired to the kitchen door where the old couple lived, which stood in one of the wings, and knocking pretty loudly, the, woman old, the old woman opened it, and with a look of astonishment fixed her eyes on the lady and her servant. Good neighbor, said Pierre, here is a great, here is a great gentlewoman cruel ill. She wants food and sleep. We have brought her here. She is not afeard of your ghosts, and so therefore you can give her a good bed, I suppose. To be sure I can, answered Bertha, which was the woman's name. To be sure I can make a f bed fit for the emperor when the linen is aired. Walk in, madam, you look very weak. Indeed, the want of rest the preceding night had so much added to her former, former feeble state that it was with difficulty they conveyed her into the kitchen. Bertha warmed a little wine, toasted a bit of bread, and leaving Jacqueline to attend the lady, she made a fire in a handsome bedroom that was in that wing, took some fine linen out of a chest, and brought it down to air. "'Dear my lady,' cried she, "'make yourself easy, I'll take care of you, and if you aren't afeard, you will have rooms for a princess.' Pierre and Jacqueline, being about to return to their daily labor, found their kindness amply rewarded by the generosity of the stranger, who gave them money enough, they said, to serve them for six months. With a thousand blessings they retired, promising, however, to call daily on the lady while she stayed at the castle, though their hearts misgave them that they should never see her more, from their apprehensions of the ghosts that inhabited the rooms above stairs. When the apartment was arranged, the lady was assisted by Bertha and laid comfortably to rest. She gave her some money to procure, them, to procure food and necessaries, and desired her servant might have a bed also. This the good woman promised, and wishing her a good sleep, returned to the kitchen. God bless the poor lady, said she. Why, she is as weak as a child. Sure, you must have come a great way from home. Yes, answered Albert, the servant's name. I love that we never find out their name until, like, they're ready to talk. Uh, we have indeed, and my poor lady is worn down by sorrow and fatigue. I fear she must rest some time before she can pursue her journey. Well, said Bertha, she may stay as long as she likes here. Nobody will disturb her in the daytime, I am sure. And what will disturb her at night? asked Albert. Oh, my good friend, answered she, nobody will sleep in the rooms upstairs. The gentlefolks who were in it last could not rest. Such strange noises and groans and screams and such like terrible things are heard. Then at the other end of the house, the rooms are never opened. They say bloody work has been carried on there. How comes it then, said Albert, that you and your husband have courage to live here? Dear me, replied she, why the ghosts never come downstairs. <laughs> why would the ghosts come downstairs? Uh... And I take care never to go up o' nights, so that if madam stays here, I fear she must sleep by day, or else have a ground room, for they never comes down. They were some of your high gentry, I warrant, who never went into kitchens. Albert smiled at the idea, but returning his discourse, asked the woman to whom the castle belonged. To a great baron, said she, but I forget his name. 
<laughs> and how long have you lived here? Many a long year, friend. We have a small matter allowed us to live, live upon. A good garden that gives us plenty of vegetables, for my husband, you must know, is a bit of a gardener, and works in it when he is able. And where is he now? said Albert. Gone to the village six leaves off to six leagues off to get a little meat, bread, and wine. What does he walk? Lord help him, poor soul, he walk. No, bless your heart, he rides upon our faithful little ass, and takes care never to overload her, as we don't want much meat, thank God. But where will you like to sleep? added she. Will you go upstairs, or shall I bring some bedding in the next room? Albert hesitated. But, ashamed to have less courage than his mistress, asked if there was any room near the ladies. Aye, sure, answered Bertha. Close to her there is one as good as hers. Then I will sleep there, said he. His good hostess, now nimbly as she could, bestirred herself to put his room in order, and was very careful not to disturb the lady. Albert was soon accommodated and retired to rest. In the evening the lady came down into the kitchen much refreshed and expressed her thanks to the good woman for her kindness. "'Heavens bless your sweet face,' cries Bertha. "'I am glad to my heart you be so well. "'Ah, as I live, here's my Joseph and the ass.' She ran out into the court to acquaint her good man with what had befallen in his absence. "'As sure as you be alive, Joseph, she is some great lady under trouble, poor soul, "'for she does sigh so piteously, but she has given me plenty of money to get things for her, "'so you know it's nothing to us if she likes to stay here.' I'll finish the sentence. It's nothing to us if she likes to stay here. So much the better. All right. So that was 10 minutes already. Um, nothing too much has happened yet, I suppose, although we do have our creepy castle all set up and a distressed noblewoman trapped in it. We don't know her name yet. Uh, but you can pick up next time by uh, control effing for the phrase... Uh, if she likes to stay here, so much the better. And then you can start with, I hope. Uh, and I will look away so I don't fall into the temptation of reading ahead any further. And um, I guess I guess that's it for this week. Or this thing, however often we're going to do them. I look forward to some terrible ghosts and bloody floors and screams and groanings. Hopefully they'll show up in your session. Bye-bye, Sugar Plum. Have fun. Also, I just, I have to tell you this. Um, I glanced at the Castle of Wolfenbach encyclopedia page, Wikipedia page, eh, same thing. Uh, and I just sort of happened to glance at the table of contents. And under literary themes, the first literary theme is fainting and weeping. So I didn't scroll down because I'm trying not to spoil myself, but I think we have something awesome ahead of us.